What's up, skeptics? Welcome to another episode of Reason to Doubt, your source for all things skeptical. I'm your host, Jordan, and with me again, after a brief hiatus, is Jared. How's it going, Jared? It's going well. It's glad to be back. I'm glad to be here to talk about things that I'm not really qualified to talk about, so... Yeah, I mean, that's kind of our MO here. Why would we talk about... If we only talked about things that we were qualified to talk about, we'd probably... Like Dungeons and Dragons, probably that's about all I'd talk about. I mean, we, we probably could do a Dungeons and Dragons podcast. But that's true. One yeah. of 10,000. Uh, yeah. We try to so try to quote at least quote experts, people who know what they're talking about. Today, though, uh, we're going to be talking about something that I know a little bit about. We're going to be talking about nuclear power plants, specifically what happens when you shoot at them. Yeah. Or what doesn't happen when you shoot at them? We'll right. find out. Uh, and since I'm not qualified to talk about this at all, uh, we're kind of going to do more of a question and answer thing. We're like, I play the layman because I am the layman in this situation. <laughs> and I'm going to kind of just spew out some of the things that I've heard on the media and some of my own curiosities from like not knowing about the, the topic at all and see what kind of how Jordan with his expertise, particularly in nuclear engineering, can can give us to help us kind of maybe quail some of our fear or hype some of our fear, whether, to, you know. Well, tune it to accuracy. For those who aren't aware, uh, there's a war going on in Ukraine because Russia has invaded a sovereign nation and is trying to conquer it. Don't listen to any of the nonsense they're saying. That's exactly what they're doing. And as part of this, they attacked a nuclear power plant, which is really dumb. So we're going to talk about what the risk of that is and what it isn't and whether you should be concerned. Yeah. So. Before we get into that, today's fallacy of the day is the false dichotomy fallacy, also known mm -hmm. as the false dilemma. Yeah, this fallacy. Um, I'm surprised we haven't covered it yet because it's uh, it's a pretty common fallacy that people make. Actually, yeah. a lot of times you'll hear people give a either this or that scenario. So you might hear somebody say, either you're in favor of this war or you hate the troops. Right? Which right. Could be a third or a fourth yeah. or a fifth option, you know, like um, oh, you're not Christian, you must be a Satan worshiping hippie, you know, like yeah, like that's the sort of thing. So basically it happens when you give two, or if you give three, it's called a trilemma. That maybe there's one from more than that. Basically, you give two options as if they're the only options when they are in fact not the only options. Right. C.S. Lewis actually is probably one of the most famous trilemmas, uh, which was the liar, lord, or lunatic trilemma for Jesus. Um, right. So. Yeah, I, G, either Jesus was a liar about being God, he was crazy, or he was actually the Lord, actually yeah. God. And there's like a lot of different options outside of that. He yeah. could just be mistaken. It doesn't have to be crazy. Maybe he's just wrong. I don't know. And if you stick with the L's, like legend is possible. So Right. <laughs> yeah. So the point is that there's more to it than that. Um, now, keep in mind that not all dichotomies are false. For example, mm. everything in the universe either is a potato or is not a potato. That yep. is not a false dichotomy. It's just a true statement. Yep. And you can also have a dichotomy where there may be other options that are possible, but you are only offering two options. So like if you tell your kid you can either have peas or carrots, you're not saying these are the only two foods that exist. You're saying these are the only two foods you're getting. You know? <laughs> that exist in this moment for you right now. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. The and cookies will a, exist after the fact. <laughs> right. That's not a false dilemma. That's just you giving them uh, a choice. So, Well... Speaking of false dilemmas, uh, if you attack a nuclear power plant, everything will be fine or the world will end, hmm. is what I've been hearing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. So I just did, you know, obviously, if you read the news or listen to the news or whatever, you're hearing some of this. And um, what I've heard from, from my ears and my listening is that, you know, Russia is attacking this nuclear power plant uh, in Chernobyl. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they've seized control of it. And that if they, you know, damage it, you know, we could have radioactivity like just floating in the air because of dust and there could be fires and it could cause a, like almost like a worse reaction than their initial Chernobyl is what I've heard. So. Yeah. So the power plant attack that I'm mostly concerned about is uh, the attack that happened on the 4th of March against the Zaporizhia hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, power plant that's in southeastern Ukraine. They mm -hmm. also did take over Chernobyl. Yeah. But in this one, on the 4th of March, they planned and executed an attack on an active running nuclear power plant. It included armored vehicles and RPGs and 
potentially artillery, definitely small arms fire. And they focus their attack, it seems, mostly on the administrative and training buildings. So not necessarily the reactor where the reactions are taking place, but it did lead to a fire breaking out um, that was ultimately contained, but it could have been really bad. Yeah. So if I'm just thinking about like damage to nuclear power plants, like we had the Fukushima incident mm-hmm. several years ago and that was just, you know, a crack or whatever and led to like a lot of stuff that happened. So like my, I think my fears would be founded in the fact that I'd be concerned that they would damage something to the point where, you know, you could have a repeat of Chernobyl, right? Well, maybe not Chernobyl, but I think Fukushima is within the realm of possibility. So okay. there's a lot of a lot of things would have to go wrong to get or definitely to Chernobyl, uh, but even to Fukushima. And um, there's a lot of a lot of gradations of risk and danger between normal operation and Fukushima and Chernobyl. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of things that go there. So um, I thought. It might be worth talking about, like what would actually lead to these and um, how they might be mitigated. So people have, like, so you and other people have a really, like, like a realistic assessment of what the risks are. So you could just first, call us dumb, like. The, the, <laughs> no, you're just not educated on this topic. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, why should you be? You know, I'm I'm literally ignorant on this topic. Right. Yeah. So uh, there's. Two scenarios that I think are like likely bad scenarios, and then the worst case scenario that I'm probably going to talk about. The first one, which is related to Fukushima, would happen if the station lost power. So if the power station is no longer getting power from the grid, that's called a loss of offsite power or a loop event. It's important enough it has an acronym. And so to understand why this is a problem, you first have to know a little bit about how reactors operate. So uh, first, a disclaimer, I am a nuclear engineer. I possess a degree in nuclear engineering. It's just a bachelor's degree, and I haven't been in the industry for decades. I also have never been to this power plant. I know it's a PWR, which is a pressurized water reactor, so I'm going to be basing everything I'm saying on like PWRs in general. But the things I'm going to be talking about are pretty generic, um, and they should apply to just about any PWR. So I, I'm at, I, I can't imagine that the things I'm going to be saying, there's nothing like plant-specific I'm going to be talking about. So anyways, how a reactor operates. Well, at a basic level, a nuclear reactor operates very similarly to a natural gas plant or a coal-fired plant. You produce heat somehow. That heat heats a working fluid, usually water. That water boils in the steam, and the steam turns a turbine, and that makes electricity through whatever magical process that does. And it sends it out into the world. In the nuclear plant, obviously, the heat is produced by fission. So you've got atoms, uranium atoms, that um, neutrons interact with them, they split apart, and that's called fission, and that releases a bunch of heat, and the stuff that's left over is radioactive. And so when things are working the way they're supposed to, all that heat goes into the water and ends up making electricity. The reactor itself is has several layers of containment. So the fuel pellets that are actually the thing that are doing the fissioning, they are within a metal tube called the cladding, the fuel rods. They have cladding that's a zirconium alloy. Then all of that fuel rod assembly, that's all going to be within the reactor pressure vessel, which is a fixed steel vessel that contains a, he- a massive amount of pressure that the water is under. And then all of that is within a concrete and steel containment structure. So the thing, one of the things that makes a nuclear reactor different from a coal or natural gas plant is you can just shut off a coal fire plant, stop throwing coal in the burner, and you're, and you're done, right? Yeah. And there's nothing else. In a nuclear plant, you can shut it down, like drop the control rods. The fission will no longer be happening. However, the radioactive decay will still be going on. The stuff that when the uranium splits apart, the fission fragments are themselves radioactive, and they're going to continue to decay and produce heat, and there's nothing you can do to stop that. That's just physics. Uh, so how long do you think that would go? I mean, we're talking like months, years, days? Like, Well, so right off the bat, once you shut it down, uh, you're about 5% of the total, all, total heat of the reactor is from decay heat. So for the moment you shut it down, you're at 5%, and it'll drop off. Um, it'll drop off pretty sharp within a few days, You'll be in like hot shutdown, mm-hmm. um, but you have to continue to cool those rods, and they need to be cooled for months and years in order to be cool enough to you could just leave them 
out one that you wouldn't ever leave them in the open, but not submerged in water. Lay them out for uh, a sun ba- bathing, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So long term, what you do with these rods is you put them in what's called dry storage, and it's just you take the cask with the, the rods in it, and it's in a concrete like tomb, but there's no water circulating to cool it off. Right? Is this That's what the they did term. at Chernobyl with like the sarcophagus, basically? Like were they eh, similar? Not or? exactly. Kind of like same idea because the okay. sarcophagus there is to contain the radiation and to like to keep it from going gotcha. out. It's like a shield. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what the the like the casts that we use for spent fuel storage in America are called new homes N U H O M S, and it's literally just like a rectangular block of concrete that the the rods are in, and you can like drive past them, you can walk by them, it's you're fine, like. The vent on the top is a little bit elevated in, like, in radiation, so you probably shouldn't like lay on top of that. I mean, <laughs> if you just did it real quick and got up, you'd, you'd be fine. But yeah. like, I wouldn't like recommend pitching a tent, and, like <laughs> making your home there. That probably wouldn't be good. But like, those rods are cooled down enough; they don't need to be cooled anymore. They won't melt. Uh, rods that are in the reactor, or just like in a reactor that just shut down, or it's only you know a few days or weeks or even months from shutting down, they produce enough heat on their own to melt if they're not cooled. Gotcha. And so, so that's unlike, why it's important to keep them cooled and keep the right. cooling going. Yeah, exactly. Now in a, like a futuristic reactor, like a gen four, like the new fancy reactors that they've dreamed up, that's all done passively. But reactors that actually exist are usually gen two reactors. And these require they have some passive systems passive meaning doesn't need electricity or like um, a me- mechanical thing to happen you kind of have cooling fans like on a radiator or something that kind of dissipate heat or something like, like, like a that. like just a heat exchanger like it had a radiator that yeah. had no moving parts didn't require electricity it just happened that would be passive but for these older power systems uh these are older power plants the cooling systems are active they involve pumps and various other things that require like electric pumps and valves that require electricity to operate. Okay. And so you shut down the reactor. If you have electricity, it continues to cool and everything's fine. That's, that's the normal operation. If you lose electricity, then what happens, this is something that's designed for, uh, they, every power plant will have backup systems to try to get electricity back. It's typically through the use of several emergency diesel generators huge generators uh i think most plants have three and that's so that you each individual one can shoulder the whole load by itself it's redundant and, systems <laughs> right so it's because this is a very important system <laughs> and they're tested regularly but that way if you need to take one down for maintenance you still have two okay but most of the time all three should be up is the right. idea and so if so let's get back to the russian attack the russians attack and they you know, break power lines or cut power to the site for whatever reason, you know. So either the site has lost its connection to the grid or the grid has no power to give because there's like a total blackout in the country or something like that. In those situations, hopefully, the diesel generators will kick on. And that's the most likely scenario, that one of the diesel generators will work. They're tested regularly. I don't know what their exact model is, but it's supposed to be a very small, like less than 1% chance that none of them will work if that was the only thing going wrong. And if one of those is able to work, then they can carry the whole load. They can do that for days and maybe even weeks. Um, You know, obviously the reliability goes down over time, but you have time to fix the problem. So if the diesel generators work, you're probably fine. What if they don't work though? Because maybe the Russians decided, you know what, screw those diesel generators and those maybe are gone they, too. Maybe they needed diesel fuel for their tanks. So. Yeah, they, and they took all the fuel for the generators because they're really stupid or something. Yeah. You know, whatever reason. Or the, maybe they just failed. I mean, it is unlikely, but it can't happen. At that point, you're in a station blackout event, SBO. And this is what happened at Fukushima. So Fukushima, you had the big earthquake and then the tsunami came over the flood wall and flooded the buildings, including the diesel generators, and they failed. So that's what led to the station blackout event of Fukushima Daiichi, which eventually led to core damage. And so station blackout is one of the worst things that you can have happen at a nuclear plant. It's, it's bad. And so if that goes wrong, if you've moved from loop to SBO, now the time you have to address it is measured in hours, not days. 
Because it's only a matter of time before the core is going to get damaged. Right. So if you don't restore power, damage is going to happen. Uh, so they have there are still some mechanisms that they can do. Uh, basically, the water is just going to heat up and start to boil. And eventually, in the reactor pressure vessel, if that water boils enough, then it'll start to uncover the fuel rods. So there won't be water around the fuel rods. And at that point, their pa- their heat will spike. So they can like dump water into it, but that comes with its own problems, which I'm not going to get into all that. But they're, you know, that's yeah. not easy either. But fast forward a couple hours, if they haven't fixed anything, you're going to have meltdown in the reactor. And so once the and that's fuel bad, rod, right? That's very very bad. <laughs> okay. That's super bad. Uh, the rods will melt uh, because they're in zirconium alloy. Zirconium has this is really cool. Uh, because it doesn't absorb neutrons, so it's great for a nuclear reactor, unless things get super hot, because once it hits, I think it's 2,200 degrees Celsius, it has this uh, bad habit of uh, reacting with water to produce hydrogen, and uh, that's not great if you know anything about hydrogen. Hydrogen has this really bad habit of combining with oxygen and exploding, uh, and and, 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 and and it an intensely exothermic reaction is how we might put it in science <laughs> terms. Yeah. A rapid exothermic expansion. So, so an explosion. So a nuclear power plant with a failing, you know, heating system, the rods are overheating and now we have explosions. Like, so, right. That's the- now, so what would happen if this happened? Well, basically you'd have Fukushima. Um, depending on exactly what happened, if you had to like, if they had to vent, because like these explosions are causing pressure in the vessel, they might need to vent some mm-hmm. of that pressure to the air, and that would release radiation into the air. Um, if they have to like dump water or something, like depending on exactly what happened, Fukushima was pretty bad. Um, I think that's probably like the ceiling of this particular problem. And so you'd have a release of radiation to the environment, which is bad. However, it's not apocalypse bad. So the level of bad we're talking, level of bad I think people are imagining is like Ukraine becomes the next setting for f- the Fallout video games. And it's like a radioactive <laughs> glowing green wasteland. And like, that's just not what it looks like. And you also don't have like whole cities like having their hair fall out and people fall over and die. Like yeah, that also is Turn it into mutants and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. None of that would happen. So the kind of, kind of bad that I'm talking about, for example, look at Fukushima. Um, according to the WHO, if you're an infant who is in the Fukushima area, like in the affected area, then your lifetime risk for developing leukemia, type of cancer, went from 0.75% to 1.25%. Now, that's bad. That's like almost a doubling of your risk. That's not good. But that's like over your entire life. So like this baby is going to grow up and live a whole life before it dies of leukemia at 50, yeah. you know, which again, and I want to emphasize Still this. bad. Still bad, but not the level of bad I think some people are imagining. Right. Now, with and in with this scenario too, like this is assuming normal operating procedures within the plant, right? Because you're like you would imagine, like I don't know what the Russians' motives are, but if they're taking control, because I heard there was possibly hostages of some of the workers there, or they were keeping them from you know doing their thing. Like that's assuming there's no nefarious intentions, correct? Like and that's all this stuff happening out like it should. Well, I mean, if the Russians are trying, it, I guess it depends on what the Russians are trying to do. One would assume they're trying to take control of the plant in order to. Have power, <laughs> have have electricity, and like control the infrastructure. In which yeah. case, it would be in their best interest for it to not melt down, because that's just a whole nightmare that they've already dealt with once, and they don't probably don't want to deal with again. So, a, like, so it really depends on what the Russians' goal was. If you assume that they're like coming in to conquer and they're trying to take over infrastructure, then it would be in their best interest not to have any of this happen in the first place, and not to stop the, the workers from keeping the reactor from melting down. Right. Okay. Yeah. And again, assuming that they didn't take out the, the emergency diesel generators or didn't cut off power, things could be either fine or, you know, you have some hours to respond. Okay. So that's kind of the first scenario. Like they lose, we call this the loss of outside power, right? Because I always thought, like, oh, perpetual motion machine, you know, like nuclear, it's yeah. making its own it electricity, is- right? Like, that that was actually really really hard for me to internalize when I was in class when they're talking about oh well what if we lose power it's like we are a power oh, station how can power. we lose power <laughs> yeah. right uh, but so and it's true that the station can produce power for itself when it's operating 
But in this situation, you have to remember, we've shut down. Right. We're not producing power anymore. You, you, when you shut down, you disconnect from the turbine. Now, there are, there are some nuance to that. You can have turbines that um, operate on a lower amount of steam to try to generate some power for the plant. Kind of like Even trickle electricity, like yeah, because it's still yeah. producing heat, right? So that that's yeah. possible, but generally speaking, you need offsite power in yeah. order to have the reactor run safely in shutdown. So that's like loss of outside power. What if there was some sort of like damage or something to like the cooling system itself, or you know, like is that another possibility? Like, yeah. So again, if if the cooling system broke, like, and it does have external components, if it were if it were destroyed then you'd basically run in the same channel. The station blackout event means I'm not able to cool the core effectively. I lose water inventory meltdown. If you did some damage such that the cooling system didn't work, whatever, you're basically in the same place. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But it's not just the reactor that you need to worry about. So bad situation one, which is probably the worst, but also realistic, like plausible scenario is loss of offsite power, or I guess loss of cooling. In addition to what's in the reactor, <coughs> you also have to cool down the fuel rods that are no longer in the reactor, but aren't cooled down enough for dry storage. So these are called spent fuel, and they'll be in the spent fuel pools. And these are just big tanks of water. Well, we're talking like 12 meters deep of water. And that water's kept circulated, and you know it's contained and whatnot, but... The, cool, uh, the rods are just in there, hanging out, decaying away until they're cooled down enough. So if and then they get put in concrete. Then they get put in concrete, and ideally in some place like Yucca Mountain or something. But yeah. you know, more likely in the parking lot outside. Yeah. I'm not Jack. I'm not joking. That's literally where they are. <laughs> <laughs> in a special <laughs> parking lot. Not with Empl- employee of there. the month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go park over by the spent fuel. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so. If the spent fuel pools uh, lose the ability to cool themselves, like the the maybe offsite power got lost because kind of the same thing has happened, mm-hmm. or you know maybe the building itself was hit and the pools cracked or, or something. Somehow the system has gone awry. In this case, uh, you have several days, probably depending. I mean, unless they like completely busted open the tanks and drained all the water, you know. Right. But if they just like lost cooling. It'll take some days for all of that water to boil off. Um, so, and at, at any time before then, all you you literally just need to add water. Yeah, because like, at that point you're just—it's not like it's active, right? So you're just literally just filling yeah. it back up, like. Assuming that the the rods are staying in place, if you didn't like, I don't know, move them around under there because that can deal with issues. But probably it's just like that you're losing water. Now, if you didn't get to there in time, and all that water boiled away. Then you kind of run into the same situation as before. You the rods are uncovered. If they've been haven't been outside the core long enough, they could melt, and then you're in the same situation where you might be. It's the same rods with the same zirconium alloys. You could be producing hydrogen. Might lead to a hydrogen explosion. Um, probably not a steam explosion because I don't think the building would take that kind of pressure. But so. Well, I'm sitting here thinking. You know, obviously these buildings, especially the newer nuclear power plants they probably have to be built to sustain some sort of like i'd say natural disaster right like earthquakes Mm -hmm. and things like that are they built to sustain you know rocket damage or (laughs) bullet damage like or so yes not really intentionally per se so uh reactors are built to withstand earthquakes um they have to be fire resistant so that actually, there was a disaster that didn't reach the level of like Three Mile Island or anything, but there was basically a fire somewhere else in the plant, and it burned through the electrical conduit raceways into other things. Oh, wow. And that led to a whole disaster. There's like a chain reaction there. It didn't end up in the core melting, but that led to the industry adding a whole like fire protection element to make sure that you couldn't have fire move that easily throughout the plant. Mm. Um kind of a nuclear history aside. But anyways, um, one of the things that the reactors are built against is projectiles. So we're talking like a plane flying into the reactor containment structure. So what you have to think about with these structures, I don't know if you've ever seen them on TV. Uh, on I think most people... So most people, when they think of nuclear power plant, they think there's big towers, right? <laughs> yeah. 
That actually is not the reactor and is no way associated with reactor. Those are cooling towers, and they're not even nuclear specific. Like you can have a cooling tower for anything that you need to cool down. And they all that is Ralph Morris too when they're making tobacco. Like <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So all that is is a place for the water to expand, the steam to expand, which releases heat. And that's all it is, right? So you see steam coming out of it. There's nothing. That's literally just steam. See, I literally thought like nuclear. I thought there was like just rods like hanging in the middle of those stacks, nope. man. Just like. <laughs> nope. It is not even connected. And this is a PWR. So none of the water that's coming out of those cooling towers ever went inside the reactor building. Ever. Hmm. Completely two separate loops. Okay. So uh, if you see steam coming out of a cooling tower, it's not radioactive steam. <laughs> uh, that would be insane. But. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no big deal. Just, you know, venting some radiation <laughs> to the environment. Nobody will care, right? So, yeah. yeah. No. So, uh, in fact, it's these big concrete domes. Okay. Um, and if you look at the dome, if you like Google uh, one power plant we have in Virginia, is the Surrey Power Station or North Anna. If you Google one of those, you'll come up with these two that are these two little domes right next to each other. And that's where the reactor is. And actually... That's only like the top third of the reactor building. The rest of it's underground. And these are robust. They're, these are like several feet, like three to six feet of steel reinforced concrete. And all of it is lined with steel on the inside. Okay. And so, so, so you've got that. And then you've got the reactor pressure vessel. And then you've got the cladding. So those like, but the you reactor. You a bunch of stuff there. Yeah, <laughs> the core containment is very robust. So. The doomsday scenario that I mentioned, like the absolute worst case scenario is if you cracked containment, okay? If you destroyed this massive concrete structure. But that's not going to happen because some soldier shot it with a machine gun or even <laughs> hit it with an RPG. Like that's not going to happen. Or on honestly, and I haven't seen any studies on this but i'm pretty confident it could take an art like an artillery shell too because okay. you don't use artillery on a bunker right i just imagine it was like a bunker right because it's the same sort of thing several feet of of reinforced concrete if you want to take out a bunker you use specialized munitions for that right so if in the scenario where the containment is cracked i would imagine that it means they probably dropped a bunker buster on containment, which at this point they are trying to break. Yeah, they're doing it on purpose at that point, right? right. This yeah. is not an accident. I don't think that this is a likely outcome. Like the other two, loss of offsite power or the spent fuel pools being damaged in some way, those could plausibly happen by accident. Right. Somebody is reckless or the grid gets damaged and then, yeah. Right. Or things just get out of hand. Maybe there's a fire and it gets out of control and it hits the switch yard. You know, these are things that could, that you could reasonably see have evolved from what actually happened, right? This is not that. This is not Joe Snuffy hit the reactor building with an mm -hmm. RPG and now suddenly the whole thing's going up in a mushroom cloud. That's not it, okay? They're this not is turning like, their tanks over to aim at some guy and like, oh, they happen to be behind the... Right. Yeah. And even yeah. I don't think a tank shell would do it, not yeah, just absolutely. one for sure. Right. Like, this is like Putin is, you know what? Screw this plant. We are destroyed. If we can't have Ukraine, nobody can. And like they're... Scorched earth, you know, right. you just... So. so they've in this scenario, they've intentionally destroyed containment. Now, at this point, this is when you start getting into Chernobyl like effects, because what happened at Chernobyl, um, I won't go into the whole background, but basically they had a meltdown and and a steam explosion happened. There was pressure and it exploded. And there's this like big metal, like basically manhole that was covering the thing and that lifted this huge metal manhole and cocked it off and like threw it off to the side. So there was nothing between the reactor and the world. And this is because Chernobyl was run like a back alley meth lab. It was <laughs> so bad. I heard it. I heard if you want to know more, it's good to watch the documentaries, yeah. docu-series that was done on it. Or the, I haven't, I haven't seen it, but other nuclear engineers I know who have have said it's good. No. So, uh, I, the people I talk to, I trust their competence. And so I'd be willing to say that. Yeah. yeah. That was a good dramatization from what I understand. So anyways, uh, if you're not running your reactor, like an idiot and you built a good <laughs> reactor structure, then you're going to need an intentional strike. But at that point, if that happens, I mean, forget cooling, you're bombing the reactor. Like no, I don't care how well designed it is. It's going to like, it's gone. Right. And so you, the water's out of the picture because again you're dropping bombs in the reactor and so the core's definitely going to melt but instead of having a containment structure 
So like even in the other one where it was melting, it's still inside this concrete structure. So most of the reactor products are still in there. Like at Fukushima, like at the bottom, I mean, nobody's been in there to look, but at, it didn't come out the bottom. At the bottom <laughs> of this concrete structure, there's like a hunk of uranium magnum. They call it corium. Uh, but like there's a hunk of like melted stuff at the bottom, right? That in this case, that's not the case because you like blew it open. And so the core is just like open to the environment and it's just spewing radiation in the environment. You can't just like take some flex seal tape and like put it over top, you know, like <laughs> whack. <laughs> no. uh, I mean, I guess flex seal tape, if you actually did use enough and you're going to have to kill a lot of people to do this because <laughs> those people are going to be exposed to a lot of radiation. We're outside. It, so the other stuff I was talking about, like where you have, the danger that is plausible is like a, right. a risk increased risk of cancer in the local area, so bad but not apocalyptic. Yep. Those are called stochastic effects, which means they're statistical in nature. So I can't point to one person who got leukemia around Fukushima and say, you got it because of Fukushima. I mean, people get leukemia sometimes, so I can't say for sure. But over the entire population, I can see a measurable effect. Right. Right. Th this, that, this population has a higher rate of this compared to other populations right. right that's a stochastic effect a non-stochastic effect is like radiation sickness like you're you're bleeding out of orifices and you're losing your hair and organ failure like these are acute radiation donuts doses and we're talking non-stochastic effects at this point like if you got up there to, to seal the thing with flex tape a lot of people are going to die doing that if you did it i mean you might stop some radiation release i guess but it's not gonna be worth it not worth the lives you're throwing into it uh and so at that point you're getting into chernobyl like effects because okay. the basically there's nothing stopping the radiation release at that point um which is bad like chernobyl is super effing bad but not as bad as, as i think some people think so i don't want to minimize it because it was bad it, it killed i forget the exact numbers i should have looked this up um but whereas fukushima killed i think one person day of and we'll have some um cancer related effects in the future mm -hmm. chernobyl killed depending on who you ask a few dozen people right day of and pro maybe several hundred outside of that the evacuation itself killed more people than chernobyl itself did but something that i think people don't realize uh it was reactor four, I believe, that melted down uh, at Chernobyl. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's four. It was one of them. Uh, two of the other ones continued to operate for years afterwards. And I get, these things don't operate on their own. That people like going there, like, like even while Chernobyl was happening, there was like Bob in the other reactor, like, man, that looks crazy. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right? So like. That that was very surprising to me. I learned that when I was doing a project on Chernobyl, and I was like, "Oh, the shutdown." I was just kind of like looking at the shutdown dates. I was like, "What do you what? Like <laughs> they're still <laughs> operating? Not for very long, but you know, sometime." Right. I mean, they uh, couldn't just like walk away, right? They had to go through the process of like exactly, yeah. And so again, it's not good. Like if you went to Chernobyl now, there's elevated radiation dose, but it's not like if you walk through the site at Chernobyl and then leave, you're gonna die, like. It, it's not like so like my the way that i view it like i picture like those geiger meters you know like where you walk on it's just like, it starts ticking yeah, all the way because it's it, probably not maxed out so like yeah. you can actually look uh at, at, at readings from various sites and it's variable like the pool area uh that is in every video game ever has like slightly elevated over background it's not that bad but there's like this excavator that was like digging stuff out that's pretty radioactive and if you like went into the reactor you're gonna die like, that's for sure. Like, that is intensely radio radioactive. But what I think, so this is a good segue, I think, to just talk about how radiation works in general, because I think this is something not very many people understand. And I think that leads to a lot of this fear, because people fear what they don't understand, because radiation is scary. Yeah. So the way it works is you have a radioactive isotope, some radioactive thing, and it's decaying and spitting out particles and photons and stuff, and that's the radiation. Okay, it's spitting it basically in every direction. Okay, it's a purely and, <laughs> random like thing, or is it? Yeah, it's basically random, um, and so it's it's going to be roughly equal in every direction. Okay, and so when you're shielding from this, there are three ways to shield. There's physical shielding, 
I think that's what most people like the, the lead blanket they put on you at the doctor's office when you get an x-ray. That's mm -hmm. like physical shielding. You've also got distance. Um, radiation follows the inverse square law. So if you double your distance, you quarter the radiation because it's a sphere, right? If you, if you imagine expanding sphere of radiation, the surface area of that sphere is getting larger faster than the, the radius right. is. Okay. And so if you just get far away from the radiation, you'll be fine. And then also time, because the amount, it's not important just how much radiation there is in the area, but how long you were exposed to it. And that makes up your dose. So a very brief exposure to a medium level of radiation might even be safer than a long, long exposure to a low level of radiation. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three things you can use uh, to protect yourself. So when it comes to things like uh, a melt melted down reactor, if you're miles away and the radioactive isotopes stay at the reactor, then you're going to be fine. Now, the danger is that they won't stay there. You'll have like the dust cloud that happened at Chernobyl, where you have like radioactive isotopes that get aerosolized, like turn into gas, basically, suspended particles in the air, and then that gas cloud goes flowing somewhere. Because then you're, you're reducing that distance, right? Now the radiation's coming to you, right? Right. Or the other uh, danger, and this is more relevant to things like spent fuel pools or where disposing of spent fuel, is that it'll like get in the water. And then that it'll the water will carry the radioactive isotopes to somewhere. Okay. So that's where the danger is. Not that a distant place is radioactive, but that the radioactive isotopes from that distant place will travel to where you are, which is why the containment structure and stuff is so important. So I guess bringing it back for a second. So like something's radioactive and it's decaying, spewing off stuff. Now those right. isotopes are out there. And so <clears throat> you don't want to like, confuse the radioactive isotope with the radiation. Okay. You get, so that, yeah. one way to think about it is that uh, the radioactive isotope is the poop. The radiation is the smell. All right. So, so when you're saying like the water is you could, so you could physically take an isotope and carry it somewhere else. And mm -hmm. then, so it's like you're carrying around a bunch of poop with you, right? It's like right. the water is carrying the poop with it somewhere else. Right. Exactly. Or it gets in a dust cloud, it's aerialized, so the poops, we got a shit cloud going around. Right. right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then the smell, so like then you have the inverse square law from that isotope. Yes, exactly. Okay. Right. right. And so uh, that's why the, the cloud of radioactive isotopes coming away from Chernobyl was concerning, because it was taking that radiation from there and putting it somewhere else. Now, even then, in the place it deposited, it's not, again, it's not like people are falling over and dying from acute radiation exposure. Right. Because, you know, and also at Fukushima, another thing to recall, <clears throat> they released radiation into the water, right? And I know people are super worried about that. Especially like, in California. <laughs> yeah. But you have to remember, the ocean is a really big place, like super big. And there's a kind of joking... A phrase they use in nuclear safety dilution is the solution yeah. if you dilute something enough it's fine you know we learned about that in our homeopathy episode exactly dilution <laughs> is the solution so and it's not that dumping radioactive water into the ocean is great it's not uh but it's better it went, than the alternative right if it went randomly you're not even going to notice it now of course the the motion of the ocean isn't completely random if current so it might be selectively carried to a place and deposit non-randomly and so you so i think there was like some small increase in radiation at distant points but not enough to like kill people yeah and over time so those isotopes don't stay radioactive forever right they will eventually become non-radioactive yes uh depending on the isotope the half-lives can be in the minutes or days some are hours some are much longer um so it really depends on which isotope it is. Some of the some of them have half lives in the hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, because I heard a a news broadcaster talking about uh, they were speaking about Chernobyl, but they were saying like the tanks are going to roll over the ground and there's radioactive isotopes and the dust is going to get up and they're going to get in the air and then it's going to release more. Like that's not a concern, right? Or is it? Well, probably not. I mean, it would. Be a concern for the soldier that's like right there. <laughs> yeah. If I'm the guy that's kicking up the dust and then I'm breathing it in, I mean, he's not going to be great. You know, right. like if if Joe's private Russian Joe Snuffy is dragging his feet through Chernobyl <laughs> and not wearing a mask or anything and a, and a mask, like a literal 
hospital mask would probably be enough to protect you, you know, like definitely a gas mask. Because again, the shielding you need for these things, for the radioactive isotope itself is just dust. You just need to not get it in your system. Okay, uh, the, iso- the the radiation that's that's kicked off of this stuff, most of it is going to be alpha or beta. An alpha particle is a helium atom that has no just the nucleus, mm-hmm. and a beta is ju- is an electron. Um, those can be blocked by like your clothes, like a t shirt will block those, or like your your skin. So um, it's very easily shielded. The concern, like when they wear those suits, like like yeah. the, the plastic suits, that's not stopping like gamma rays. What that's, that's just doing for is dust particles. That's just keeping the radioactive dust away from them. So when they go out, they don't bring it with them. That's gotcha. the idea, right? Now, if you're not protected at all and you breathe it in, now those dust particles went into your lungs. There's no shielding there. It's just dumping radiation straight in your lungs. That's not good. So, like, and especially because, like, if I'm just wandering around in Chernobyl or something, even if it's a gamma emitter, if it's not like enough for acute, I'm going to take some dose and then I'm going to leave and I'm not going to take the dose anymore. But if I inhale it, I'm taking the dose and I leave and I'm bringing the dose with me in my lungs. It's just going to keep going. You have poop in your lungs now. Exactly. And so (laughs) that's the problem. So that's, so back to Joe Snuffy, if he's kicking up dust and he breathes it in, that's not good for Joe Snuffy, but it's not going to matter to some rando Ukraine. It's also not like the plague. It's not like, Oh, you're radioactive. So you're going to come like, like get the next person you touch radioactive. and It's going to spread like an illness. Like that's also not how it works. Um, you know, so there's, so yes, it's not that kicking up dust, radioactive dust at Chernobyl is not a concern at all. I, I don't, I honestly have no idea how radioactive the dust is. Uh, my guess would be it wouldn't be that big a deal, but I personally would want to wear a mask if I was going to go there. Like I've talked to my wife, uh, she was like, I've mentioned like, yeah, I'd go, to, I'd go to Chernobyl. I'd bring a dosimeter with me so I would know how much dose I'm getting and I would wear protective equipment to make sure that. I was masked up and I didn't get it like in my nose and stuff, you know, to protect myself. But right. yeah, I'd walk through Chernobyl, you know, that's fine. Uh, cause I know exactly, I know how the radiation danger works, but I'm not going to go hug the excavator machine or walk <laughs> into the reactor building yeah. you know? <laughs> or go play in the sandbox, you know, like, <clears throat> right. Like, like take up a scoop and then put yeah. it on an amulet around my neck and carry it for forever. Like, I'm not going to yeah. do that. So I guess if we get back to like, you know, what we've been hearing in the media and the news and the fears, there is kind of bring this back home. Like there is some, some concern, right. That we should be having about this, obviously not even considering the, the Russian invading of sovereign territories, just in general, we should be concerned about this, uh, but maybe not as concerned as what some are saying. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely concerning attack shooting at a nuclear plant is a very dumb thing to do. (laughs) It, nobody should be doing that. That's not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so yes, it is concerning. And, uh, the actual attack that happened, even though the attack itself was focused mostly on the administrative buildings, they are not that far removed from where the reactors are. So, and battles chaotic. It is, I mean, I think, uh, I read some later reports where some RPGs may have even impacted like the walkways between the reactors. Hmm. These are, this is not good, but it's, it's not good in the sense that you might have a, you could maybe have a Fukushima event, not, not good in the sense that like, I heard one guy say, well, if you know, this happens and it melts down, then like, it's, I I can't remember the term he used, but it was basically the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. It's not even the end of Ukraine. It's not even the end of the city nearby. It's just the end of like that plant and its surrounding areas. Even if you were to drop a nuke onto that plant, it still wouldn't be the end of the world, right? Well, if you dropped a nuke on the plant, uh, your problem is not going to be that it's a nuclear plant. The problem is going to be you dropped a nuke on it. (laughs) The nuke is the problem there. I would be no more concerned about dropping it or less concerned at dropping a nuke on a nuclear plant as I would anywhere else. Like right. the fact that you dropped it on a nuclear plant is almost completely beside the point because you dropped a nuclear <laughs> weapon on it. Like, you yeah. know, it, well, it, <laughs> the, lev- the level of danger there is so mismatched. It doesn't even matter. In fact, honestly, because nuclear power plants tend to be far removed from population centers um, by design, and not that like nobody lives near them, but they're not like in the middle of a city typically, a nuke on a nuclear site might be better than a nuke like downtown. It's, it's not again, your 
priority target when it comes to <laughs> dropping. I mean, maybe your, it is, but yes. if you're if you're aiming to kill people and that's your goal because you're a you know evil person, you want to bomb a city center, not the nuclear yeah. plant. Oh, don't listen to us if you're an evil person. So, right. Yeah. Uh, and don't attack nuclear plants just in general. It's not like yeah. The key takeaway from this is it is a risk. There is actual real danger involved, and it could have actually gone very bad. So, but the what very bad means is not what most people think when they're mm-hmm. talking very bad. They're thinking, you know, hundreds of thousands of people dead, and it's not like that. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, I obviously I was completely ignorant, like I said at the beginning of this, but just listening to you and asking a few questions, like I feel like I have a better grasp and understanding of the material. And like, just, you know, obviously this is a baseline thing, but I'm not as scared now and I'm not as like worried that something, you know, world ending is going to happen. So yeah, not going to be world ending. No one in America is going to be affected in any way whatsoever. Even if the reactor melted down, even if they cracked containment, well, nobody we in America. Get a, a, a shipment of Flex Seal, and then we're good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Boom. Some duct. Throw some duct tape on it. It'll be fine. Oh. All right. Well, that's our show, guys. Hopefully, you learned something about nuclear power and how radiation works and why it is scary, but maybe not as scary as you thought. Ho- hopefully, you came away with this less concerned, unless maybe you hadn't heard about them attacking the nuclear plant at all. In case, oh my gosh, they're attacking nuclear power plants? <laughs> maybe, maybe your concern spiked and then hopefully came down a little bit yeah. th- toward the course of the episode. Uh, let us know what you think to this episode, if it was useful. If you'd like more stuff like this, I'll talk nuclear power to literally anyone for any reason, basically. So uh, <laughs> let us know in the comments of whatever platform you're checking this out on and share it around if you see somebody else freaking out about whatever headline they saw about the end of the world coming because of what's happening in Ukraine. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jordan, but for enlightening us. Appreciate anytime. it. Anytime. Yeah. And until next time, remember, you've always got reason to doubt. Peace out. <laughs>